Minnesota Original is made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota. Minnesota Original is a new weekly series produced by Twin Cities Public Television. Each week, the series will showcase the depth and breadth of Minnesota's creative community and introduce viewers to the many original artists who produce extraordinary work right here in Minnesota. On this premiere edition of Minnesota Original, Minneapolis photographer Alex Soth is recognized worldwide for his compelling photographs that uniquely capture the spirit of his subjects. We're with Alec while he prepares for his first exhibit at Walker Art Center. In a world, yeah, where there are 500,000 pictures a second being uploaded onto Facebook, you know, what does it mean to be a photographer in that environment? Heather Doyle is a blacksmith, a welder, and a metal sculptor. She finds inspiration for her work in this machinery shop. I really, really love cogs and sprockets and chains in this section. I use them often in my artwork. John Munson and Matt Wilson have rocked the Twin Cities music scene since the 80s, starting with their band, Trip Shakespeare. It's a magical time again for the duo, now performing as the Twilight Hours. These artists and more... Everything we are, for better or for worse, is in our work. On Minnesota Original. No matter who you are, everyone's going to say one sentence about you. This, my 8x10 camera, he's the guy that photographs Weimarheimers. She was a student of so-and-so. For better or worse, this camera sort of became my trademark. And you can't really create that sentence, but you can sort of help determine what it's not. <laughs> my favorite thing about it is actually looking through it. There's just something really beautiful about the way it renders space. Alex Soth is an artist who uses photography to really tell stories, um, but he's doing this in a, in a way that is not the traditional type of storytelling with photography. This idea of um, finding the beauty in the unexpected, um, looking in out of the way places for subjects and for and scenes that that somehow evoked an America or a or a place that um, people would not really anticipate. In 2004, Alec was chosen as one of the artists in the Whitney Biennial, which is a, a showcase nationally of American artists. It's a show meant to take the pulse of what's happening in American art and includes a spectrum of artists from emerging to to well known. And uh, for a virtual unknown as he was at that time, it was a huge launching pad. An image from his series Sleeping by the Mississippi ended up being the image on the poster for the biennial. So it, it, it suddenly went viral, and it was, <laughs> it was a, um, a really kind of incredible moment. Uh, Sleeping by Mississippi was my first project. I mean, the first one that, I, as I said, that I felt was you know, somehow worthy of more attention, trying to get out of the Twin Cities area. This work was made over a number of years. The work itself is not, it's not a documentary of the Mississippi River. This is, if you actually look at the book, there are very few images of the Mississippi. Um, it's really, I'm using the Mississippi as a metaphor for wandering, you know, and just that, that kind of boyish sort of going with the flow wandering. This is Bonnie, she's a, a Pentecostal preacher's wife uh, in Mississippi. So what happened was I met her husband and then he invited me to this Thursday evening prayer service. I went to that and then afterwards they invited me to their home. I went to their house and she had this picture sitting out uh, in the living room and I was really attracted to it. Like why do you have a framed picture of a cloud? And it turns out it's a picture of an angel. It was an interesting night because she was trying to convert me and I was trying to get a picture of her. And she kept taking this picture and sort of nudging it closer and closer to me. Um, so it was, and I, I think this, I think of this portrait as like a staring contest where we're, you know, engaged with each other. We both want something from each other. Want 
Preparing for an exhibition at the Walker Art Center. The exhibition's in September 2010, which, uh, you know, maybe sounds like a, a long ways off to some people, but it's like next week to me. It's terrifying. The Walker Show will be his first U.S. Uh, survey. So it covers the last 15 years of the work and really touches on a lot of the themes that have been prevalent in the work since, since I bet, the early 90s, actually. A really interesting one to me was um, a project called 33 Movie Theaters that tells us a lot about America and about what's happening with our landscape, our small towns. So this wall over here represents pictures made in Texas at mostly former movie theaters in Texas. You know, my favorite one is this one right here. Um, it says, Welcome to Downtown Paris. It's made in Paris, Texas. You know, one of the pictures that I really like next to it here is this one, which is, uh, so this is, you know, this classic former movie theater, which has now been turned into a video store and, and apparently a laminating store. Um, and these, these fallen bikes, so it's sort of sad and beautiful. Sometimes I want to get this camera off my back. I've always had a real problem with the medium of photography. I was a painfully shy person, so it's really strange that I've made a life out of approaching strangers. And photography is an incredibly limiting medium. Being frozen in time means you can't really tell stories, you know? Um, it's very fragmentary. In a world, yeah, where there are 500,000 pictures a second being uploaded onto Facebook, you know, what does it mean to be a photographer in that environment? He's an artist who is um, eminently approachable in terms of the work, I think. Um, it's the kind of work that, that you're instantly drawn to because there's, there's something unexpected in it always. Um, there, there's always a, a pose or, a, or a, an item in the picture or um, a location that, that takes you by surprise. It's, it's not traditional portraiture in the way that, um, that we might anticipate it. And there, there's something that, that begs us to just keep looking and looking. And the longer we look, the more we see in each of these. And um, so I think he, he's, he's an artist who's one of the, the great you know, storyteller photographers I'm working today. MNOriginal.org is Minnesota's first arts video portal with all the show's stories, bonus concert footage, web exclusives, and more. Friend us and stay connected to our creative community on MNOriginal.org. I come to Amble's Machinery to walk the yard, to um, imagine what the piece is going to be like. This happens all the time in Amble's. I'll see something and be like, well, what was it? What could it have been? And I can tell that it was like a shovel for a backhoe or something. But immediately when I looked at it, I saw sleigh. So it could be a sleigh. Next. My name is Heather Doyle, and I'm a metal sculptor and a blacksmith, and I teach sculptural welding and blacksmithing at uh, Minneapolis Community and Technical College. And I am also um, very soon to be the artistic director of the new Chicago Avenue Fire Art Center in South Minneapolis. There isn't a lot of opportunity for, you know, uber fashion in my life because I go from, like, um, mom to metalwork. So the fashion sense is, uh, it comes out in weird t-shirts and weird socks. This is gonna go whoosh, so. And that's a forge. And we're using seven pounds of pressure, which brings the forge up to about 2,300 degrees, which will bring our metal up to a nice orange in just a few minutes. We're gonna be flattening the ends to um, connect to the bottom um, of the typewriter and I'll just drill through the flattened portion then and use the existing screws that are coming out of the typewriter to fasten it together. 
I found this typewriter about 20 years ago, and it's been a tool for me, kind of a cathartic tool to um, process through uh, ideas that were spinning in my head. And I don't actually record, there's no paper in the typewriter, I just type on it just because I like the uh, mechanical feel of the typewriter itself. And so I've had it in my life for a really long time, and of course my children have grown up with this typewriter. My oldest daughter, Anya, asked me if she could have it. So I decided to make it into a table for her, and I'm forging some swoopy legs for it that will support a tabletop that will um, go to my daughter. Yeah, forging, you stay really closely connected to the material. I think the most signature element of my style is the um, the Art Nouveau swoop. It doesn't have enough swoop action, if you ask me. I also use a lot of industrial elements, cogs and sprockets and that type of thing. And really, it's the combination of the two. This is my favorite aisle. I really, really love the uh, cogs and sprockets and chains in this section. I use them often in my artwork. I, I can guarantee that something in this aisle will inspire me. It always does. So this is my very favorite aisle. And I have spent hours, hours, literally, hanging out in this aisle. Yeah, finding cool stuff. Very nice. I also like that steel we think of in this culture as being something really hard and immovable. And it's not. When you add heat, it's really organic and flowing and um, beautiful to work with. It's a lot more plastic, a lot more like, like clay. In the past, this metal sculpture realm, it's been male dominated. It doesn't need to be um, something that involves 25 inch biceps. <laughs> Not that I don't have pipes. I do have pipes. I think that it is very empowering. It is uh, really inspiring to women. And just try it. Just try it and if it, if it strikes a chord with you, if it makes your heart beat faster, it's completely attainable. Just start. I don't think you could ever play the same note twice. Just because every person is different, every instrument is different. And even when I pick up the violin, it doesn't feel the same. Not, not even close, I mean. It's a very, uh, it's a live thing. I love St. Paul. It's, uh, it's a city that's not a city. It's busy, but it's not so busy that there's constant noise and, and distraction. Small coffee, thank you. Coffee is essential. Coffee is the catalyst. It makes all the difference in the world. Without a good, with a good cup of coffee, I can do anything. At least I think I can. <laughs> My name is Joe Paquette. I'm a plein air painter, which is a, a, a fancy French term for open air painting. Actually, when I'm doing this, I'm 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 getting into the day. It's uh, it's like if you uh, like to work out, it's doing your warm up exercises. It's just getting in, getting your head in the right place putting out the color and uh, 
I'm not even think I don't even think about the paintings yet. There's a quote from a from a contemporary painter. You know, when Larry Bird makes that three-pointer from outside the circle, he said, the whole world claps, but when the artist makes that mark on the canvas, you know, you're the only one that sees it. Corot used a phrase, uh, painting a painting, if you're doing it well, is like blowing up a balloon. Every time you blow in a breath, you work the whole thing. The goal, obviously, is for no two paintings to be anything alike. got a tapestry of color and value and what I'm trying to do is intuitively orchestrate it in a beautiful way and uh, create a harmony with it. That is a, it's a subjective truth, I guess you'd call it. And when, uh, when it's done magically, when you can combine the beauty of, of observation and the difference in each day, the beautiful things that make everything so exquisitely different, and do it in a way that you feel it intensely, then you have a chance to leave something behind that really is yours. With painting, every stroke, every mark counts. That means there's a, you have a responsibility to what's in front of you. And in the 20th century, there's this wholesale idea that, uh, you know, that your idea of something is everything. I love concepts, I love ideas, but they don't keep you warm at night. And I never thought you had to recreate the English language to say something new. You just had to have something to say. To me, to find beauty in a place where most people don't pay attention is much more exciting. I jokingly say uh, God was tired by the time he got to Minnesota. He, all, the, all the bluffs are the same size and shape and the same color. And he, uh, he saved all his energy for California and, uh, and, the, uh, and the coast of Maine, I think. But uh, it's here, you know, the painting of the uh, taconite plant. To me, that's very beautiful. You know, I was with a couple of artists. We were painting up outside of Duluth in Superior. We, we were driving down the road to go to uh, Beaver Bay, and I looked out the window, and the sun was shining through the steam up coming off of this fresh pile of taconite. And uh, me and my in incredibly bizarre uh, sensibility, I said, stop the car immediately. I'm getting out. And they dropped me off, and I froze my tail off. But it, it just absolutely spoke to me of everything that is Minnesota. It's absolutely utilitarian, yet it's absolutely beautiful in its utilitarian quality. I think ultimately uh, our work is us. It's a reflection, it's a mirror, whether you like it or not, and, and most people don't like that very much. But the fact is that um, everything we are, for better or for worse, is in our work. And so if you have an uh, inability to open, if you have a, a fear of uh, risk, if you have a fear of uh, uh, commitment, any of those things, uh, it sounds funny, but it's absolutely true. Part of getting better as a painter is developing as a human being, and it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's something that's very dicey and it's very difficult to talk about, and it's not something I talk about a lot, but it's there. Because once you get to a certain point level with your craft, if you, your drawing is fairly solid and your color and your value and all those things, what's left is you and what you do with that. It's all down to um, getting some soul across and, and seeing something meaningful. Matt and I met about 25 years ago, and we've been doing music together ever since. The first band that we um, had where we were really working on our own stuff was uh, Trip Shakespeare, and, and that band started in the, about 1985, which is kind of amazing. I don't know very many other artists who have managed to do that. I failed to hear her speak of many things. We convinced Dan, my brother, to come back from uh, San Francisco. We toured our butts off and played all over the Midwest and the East Coast. We just kind of kept doggedly pursuing our dream of what the music should be and and sure enough these like guys started coming around and going like 
we're going to sign you up to a record contract and make you a star. Yeah. And so we made these these five recordings. And Lulu, we put it out, and it was flowery. And um, meanwhile, the whole world was uh, kind of going towards... Um, Seattle. Kurt Cobain and this much uh, grungier thing than us. But the record just... It kind of died, right? Or did it, mm -hmm. it didn't do a damn thing in terms of commercial. It didn't find an audience. And I, and I really thought I was a big boy. And, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, it's like you do what you do. And I love the record. But I, I think that there was this big, huge third of me that was just kind of secretly, quietly just crushed. Meanwhile, um, Dan, my brother, and John and a friend, Jake, were... Uh, Kind of, it was kind of as I was becoming maybe less tolerable and getting, getting uh, a little wiggier. And these guys were working on dance songs and dance was starting to flower. And uh, Trip Shakespeare just kind of stopped and Semisonic just kind of jumped right out of that. When we started playing together most recently, you know, we were just going to be a duo. It's going to be John on upright bass, me on acoustic guitar, and we would just do whatever we could do with that and we'd, we'd limit ourselves like that. And, you know, pretty soon there's drums, and now I'm playing a little electric guitar. John got rid of the upright, and he's playing um, electric bass. And it's right back to just, you know, the same phantom sound that we've been chasing after for years and years. The record that we made, Stereo Night, when we were making the record, The Twilight Hours didn't exist. It was just kind of what we were working on at the time. But we put together this band, The Twilight Hours, and I think we both kind of have that feeling about this band now, that we've got this special new thing, and it's it's alive, and it's a, a collaboration. The songs are are taking on a new life. Now the band has kind of evolved a sound. So you bring in this new song and the band makes it alive, like it very quickly becomes just a living work of art. Yeah, what happens to it is uh, unpredictable and uh, uncontrollable and really, uh, it's really exciting. I went through a period when uh, John was off and my brother was off doing so well on Semisonic and I was kind of becoming again and trying to figure out what my next path was. And the part about I got a job as a dime store clerk and now our song is on the speaker every day at work, you know, that's kind of like a, <laughs> a little bit of semi, semi, my uh, semi sonic experience. She. Huh. What's that yeah. all about? No. I got that, was that, I supposed to not see through that little yeah, device? Take it out <laughs> Even though our paths have diverged from time to time, you know, we've found compelling things about our partnership and reasons to come back and, and do music together. I think the main one being that it, it's pretty fun. On the next edition of Minnesota Original. Our knowledge of a space, especially a big space, has to do with the inside and the outside. We look inside, we look at the beautiful light, we look, and then we look outside, but we go back and forth. Is it possible to make a drawing that deals with both inside and outside? Certainly when I was growing up in Calcutta and now here too, 
the most common experience is running for the bus, you know. And if I'm running for the bus in my sari, okay, what do I need to do? I think about that and how that will mesh with this very clear classical position here. And then somewhere in the middle falls the dance. And in the coming weeks, you'll see more art. For me to put myself in my model's place is huge and to realize that they are very vulnerable. You're asking them to do something that's out of their element and you just need to let them know that they're in good hands. And more music. When I was still a teenager, I had this one riff that I really liked. It goes like this. All right! There are certain songs, like Love is a Law, they're their most memorable and they're the most fun to play. I swear, I think Love is a Law is the one that lives the longest, though, I think. It just sounds. It sounds fresh to me every time I play it. Right here on Minnesota Original. Minnesota Original is made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota.